Okay, so that was the uh, open book portion of the test. Now, get out your pens and papers, and we're going to have the real test coming up. No. No? That's no. What, you, you did pay attention, right? So you, no, no, they were yakking. Oh, I see. Wow. 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 Man, I'm telling you, you're in trouble now, boy. Well, good morning, church. Welcome. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So, uh, if you're watching online today, please let us know. Say hi in the comments uh, so we know that you're with us this morning. And, of course, this is we're in the midst of our Season 2. Believe it or not, I mean, wow, Season 2 and Episode 3 already. So this Wednesday, because you guys didn't have Bible study last week, I'm thinking this Wednesday night we might have to do a twofer that night. So have back-to-back -back episodes. Uh, so Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we're going to continue with The Chosen again, and uh, episode 2 and episode 3. And uh, if you haven't had the opportunity, if you're online, you haven't had the opportunity to, be, to experience The Chosen, you really, really need to. It's, it's life-changing. Uh, then coming up, we got a lot of fun stuff coming up in here. We have the men's breakfast on September 2nd already. Can you believe that? It's next weekend. Wow. I'm coming. Biscuits and gravy back. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll be I, sure, Denny. I got your back. I think so, yeah. So biscuits and gravy and all kinds of good stuff to eat. Uh, 9 o'clock a.m. Be here and uh, bring a friend if you'd like. And then that night, we start our movie series. Gracie Street Cinema. We're going to start the trilogy for the Chronicles of Narnia. And the movies are right back there on the shelf. Brought them in this morning so that everybody can see them. So we're going to do the whole trilogy series. And it's an awesome movie. Um, it's written by C.S. Lewis based on his books. Now he did a complete long series of books on these. We only have three movies. Because uh, there's only been three movies made. But... Uh, the imagery, this was to introduce people in a non-threatening way to the principles of what God is about and what the biblical principles are in a different way, kind of bringing it into a different kind of view. So it doesn't follow scripture, I'll just tell you that up front, but it is a wonderful way to kind of bring people into that experience and have them have a little bit different understanding of what uh, scriptures are about so following up after that we're going to have orange track racing again and that is on the ninth. and uh, I just can't believe that we're this far through the season so the season ends in November so I mean you know it's like the last three months it just seems like we just started and here we are at the end again um, so we have orange track racing over here September 9th registration starts at 9 o'clock, racing okay. starts at 10, and should be a great time, and we always have lots of concessions and fun stuff in the back, um, and I don't know if you've ever had the biscuits and gravy at Orange Track Racing. I bet not. But, yeah. <laughs> she didn't say anything for a change, so I, I, I usually come in and, and ask her if the biscuits and gravy are ready. Of course, she doesn't make biscuits and gravy, so... It's kind of a fun joke for me. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Shall we go to God in prayer and, and open up our time of worship this morning? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for that gift of humor. Thank you, Lord, that you uh, bring us together in here and that we can fellowship together here in a non-threatening way and that we are free and open to talk about you and to talk about the things that you do in our world and in our lives and and what our portion is in your plan. We just praise you and thank you for that. So today as we hear the message, as we go through this next session, uh, we ask that you would open our ears to hear and our eyes to see the wonders and the glories of your world that you've created for us. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts to receive that message in and then give us the ability, enable us to to live that message out day to day and bring that good news of hope and salvation to a broken world. 
So we just praise you and thank you as we open up this time of worship today and bring your Holy Spirit in among us right now. And just fill us full of your grace, your mercy, and your love as we hear about your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So our call to worship that Pastor Terry has chosen this morning comes from Matthew 4, verse 24 from the New Living Translation. And it says, news about him spread as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick. And whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Now, what sets this apart is, if you remember back in that culture and in those days, um, you had the Gentiles and you had the Jewish community, and the two did not intermix, except for some trade, things like that. They really had nothing to do with each other. And so here Jesus comes, and he is starting his ministry here on earth. Now we know that his first ministerial act, or his first miracle that he did to start his ministry was at the wedding when they ran out of the wine and he turned water into wine. And news of that spread, as we've kind of seen through episode one, and, or season one, and word of that spread of what he did, and people came to believe because of the miracle, but now, his ministry is progressing and people are coming for sicknesses and healing because they see him as a healer, as a teacher. They don't see him necessarily at this point as the Messiah, but that's the message that he's trying to bring to him at the same time. But if we think back through the Bible and we go all the way back to Genesis and we look at, at what God has done throughout time, up until the time of Jesus, God used human instruments to perform and interpret his miracles. We'll call those agents, if you will. And we, we think of those that he used throughout the Bible, and we see so many times in there, starting with Moses and ending through the apostles in here, of God using people to work his plan, to be used as instruments to bring his word to other people. And the greatest of his agents was as the man, Jesus Christ. Now we know that Christ interprets out to be Savior. So Jesus the Savior. But he came to earth as a man. He was human. He was flesh and blood just like we were. And Jesus was known both as a teacher and a healer to those who had run across him or who had heard about him in those days. And as he, uh, healing miracles attracted the suffering of humanity, those who were going through the worst of the worst, and he compassionately ministered to their needs. He didn't say, hey, prove to me that you're worth it first, and then maybe I'll take care of what you need. See, there was no condition. It was all unconditional for those people. And so people heard that, hey, I don't have to jump through hoops like I have to any time I go to one of the priests or the Pharisees in the temples. No. Jesus lived among them, he taught among them, and he ministered among the people as a common person himself. But he was really God. These opportunities to teach resulted then in attracting large crowds, and people started following him in crowds. And If they heard he was going to be in a certain area, people from that entire region would come and walk. Now again, remember, there was no buses, there was no mass transportation. So these people would leave their lives, their families, whatever they were doing, their jobs, they would leave those to come. So you have to think about what a commitment those people had to make just to come and see him and to be with him. And so when we think about that, these miracles allowed Jesus then to minister and to attract more followers and to teach. So there was no internet, there was no superhighway, there was no mass media in those days. And so how did you get word out? It spread by word of mouth, person to person. So if you notice where he did his ministering, they were all in trade centers. So people from the regions passing through, then his word would spread out 
throughout all of the regions. And that's how you got all the people. And that's how that word come back through. Somebody had a great plan. Uh -huh. So Jesus healed many of their sicknesses, which then opened the door for preaching the gospel to them. Jesus used all means, all means to help people in their various needs and point them to their greatest need, which was salvation. That's what he came to to start with. And there's no conflict between meeting social and physical needs and providing them spiritual necessities. <coughs> so if we think about that and go back to what they were used to with the uh, priests in the temple and those kind of things, and they were so strict to the law, people had to hear to these things, well, you can't receive God's blessing because you did this or this or this. And so they kind of disqualified them. And Jesus said, nobody gets disqualified in me. Bring me your broken and your needy. Jesus' love for people led him to minister to all of their concerns, not just a few, not just one. The result was that news about him spread all over a large crowd following. <coughs> Think of it this way. What better way than prior to that information superhighway to spread the good news than to get people involved. Getting people involved. Think about that one. Word of mouth remains a very effective in getting your message out. Jesus' example set the agenda for today's church then to join in this ministry for needs and proclamations to the world to get that gospel message out. And what effective program of that is Obviously, evangelism. You tell one or two people, and they tell one or two people, and they tell one or two people, and next thing you know, you've got hundreds that hear that good news. Are you engaging others? How are you engaging others? Let's think about that today. Father God, we just ask that you would lift Pastor Terry up today in the message that you put upon his heart to bring to us today. We praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here together. And we ask that special blessing on Terry as he brings us that message of hope and of understanding today. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to live this message out each and every day. In Jesus' name. Sermon slide gets popped up here that Mark's going to go and look at it and go, what? Because I sent him the email this week with the call to worship and it said, working title, tensions. Because throughout the whole episode, as I watched it like six times, all, I'm just <clears throat> beaten up by the fact that they were butting heads and not able to agree on things. And it all starts with a bunch of people standing in line. Now, think about it. when was the last time you had to stand in line to get somewhere? Standing in line at the restaurant, standing in line at, to go to a concert, standing in line to do this, standing in line, you know, whatever that is. What was it like? How did you feel? What were the feelings that were going through? It's like, can these people please hurry up? I got things to do. I mean, we're in such a rush. There's a song in there. But in this week's episode of The Chosen, the people that we're seeing all lined up when we watch this episode are people waiting to see Jesus, waiting to be healed by Jesus. Each one is waiting. They're hoping. They have probably all these multitude of thoughts going through their heads. And the disciples, they've got their own thing going on in their heads. They are acting like, you know, concert security team and if you've ever been to a concert you see the guys or the gals with the black t-shirts on security well there was a lot of bouncing and back and forth and people pushing and shoving trying to because people are budging people are trying to get ahead they want to get through there they want to see Jesus But these days, I don't see so much of that security team. I mean, you see them, 
but more often than not, it's not general seating anymore. You have assigned seats. Even if you go to the theater now, you pick your seat. You get there, you sit down, you recline. You fall asleep. You fall asleep. <laughs> it's a completely different experience going to the theater and going to concerts today than it was. I remember as a youth pastor taking the kids, there was, uh, I don't know, Winter, or Winter Jam was downtown at the, what's now the Alliant Powerhouse. And we were in line with the kids. There was probably, what, 10 or 12 kids with us, something like that. And we were, it was out the building and down the, the alley and around the back of the building. And we were around the back of the building. And they were all like, we should have gotten here sooner so we could get better seats. <laughs> Last time we showed up to a concert early, we were like the first ones to show up, which was really kind of neat though, but because we got to talk to Todd Agnew. And he told us where the best place to sit was so that the sound didn't cancel. It's like talking to Mark about sound. It's like, sit here, you'll hear better. It won't cancel out the sound. But it, it's just all these things that keep going on. And these people are, well, we call it FOMO today, fear of missing out. They were, there was a fear of missing out on that healing. Now you think of all that, and that sounds just crazy, but there are countries in this world right now where people line up like that just to get medical care. They literally have to physically, it's not call up the doctor, get online, make your appointment and go. It's go and stand in line until you can be seen. Now, that is what these people were doing. And all the while, the disciples are talking amongst themselves, wondering, well, we're doing this. We're keeping the people in line. Jesus is working. You know, he got, as soon as we got here, he just started healing people. When is the battle going to start? When are we going to get to fight those Romans? And that's where their brain was. They were right with all the rest of the Jewish people that, it was Jesus the Messiah, or the Messiah, was coming to free them from the Romans. And as I thought about that, I thought, well, what about before the Romans took over that area, what were they thinking? And before that, what were they thinking? Because there was a, a great deal of time there where they were basically under somebody else's rule. So it wasn't necessarily the Romans that he was going to set them free from. And this is also the beginning of the disciples' journey. They had just been called by Jesus. In fact, as we've watched the series, we're only a couple weeks into Matthew joining them. And so this is really up front. So there's not a whole lot of design behind it. There's not a whole lot of order. It was first come, first serve. And, you know, we talked about it. Those that were sicker probably wanted to go, me first. I'm sicker than you. <laughs> My malady is worse than yours. You can't park in handicapped. I'm more handicapped than you. I literally have heard that before. It's not about that. And then there were those that were being brought by others. Kind of like when the four friends lowered their friend into the middle of the room for Jesus to heal. That's a whole nother layer that they had to deal with. And as I'm watching the scenes develop and, and come on and I'm drawn back into the scriptures. I'm sitting there going, they're running around, use the term chickens with their heads cut off, trying to keep things in order. What about Jesus? What is he going through? What is, and we never really dive into that too much. At the end of this uh, episode, we see a very uh, exhausted Jesus, but we don't really talk about what he has been doing or going through. But what I see is I see him 
talking to each person. I see him empathizing with what they and their families are going through. Showing true concern. This past week, I was uh, brought into our customer service team meetings to talk about how to discuss a certain type of issue that customers have been having. I said, the number one thing that you need to do is start by listening to them, putting yourself where they are at. I talked to, and I used an example, I had talked to a lady, she was mad because her service was not the greatest. That wasn't the bottom of that discussion. When it got down to it, she had lost her husband last November and her son in July. She couldn't talk to the people that she needed around her for that support. There was the basis of the conversation that I had to work from and use that. And so that's what I talked to them about. And so that's what I imagine Jesus doing, getting to that base of what was going on. And I can see him smiling as he heals each one, reveling in the joy that he sees in their faces. They may be a paralytic that jumps up and walks for the first time ever, or hears, or sees, or speaks, taking joy in them being healed. And then, as Mark was talking about this morning, I see those people leaving, going home, and not just waiting until they get home, but all along the way home, telling everybody, look at what Jesus did for me. His fame growing because of that. That's what kept the people coming and coming and the line getting longer. At one point, Matthew says, well, there's 50 in line, and we've, he's already helped, and I forget what that number was off the top of my head, and there's more still coming. And he, Matthew's pretty matter of fact because, you know, he's that numbers guy. But the line just kept getting longer. And it's a different type of crowd, an anxious crowd. And that's why I had Mark go through that uh, call to worship passage this morning from Matthew 4.24. But if we expand on either side of that, we see what it, that it's more than just healing. If we go to start with verse 23, it says, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. News about him spread as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick, and whatever their sickness or disease, or if they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Large crowds followed him wherever he went, people from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea and from the east of the Jordan River. And as I read that over and over again, I I used Google. I said, Google, how big was Syria in Jesus' day? <laughs> and it brings up a relatively decent map. But to look at it, the coastline along the Mediterranean for Israel is like this. So, you know, think of the map, it's about like this. But when you add Syria, it goes all the way up to the southwest corner of Turkey. And then Israel is only, you know, this little piece. And Syria is this huge piece. So it's not more, it's not like it's a few times bigger. It's several times bigger. And here they're saying that news about him spread as far as Syria. Something we could probably drive in, well, I know Mark could drive it in a day. He's professional driver now <laughs> driving around the country but it's a matter where you can get somewhere driving eight or ten hours or you can hop in a plane and fly and it's done quickly this is an area where they walked or they rode their donkeys and that's about it and his fame was growing that fast so you see jesus wasn't just healing though he was preaching and teaching the message of the gospel the good news to anyone and everyone who wanted to hear it. Unfortunately, that number seems to be dwindling these days, but that's why we're here. We want to make sure people hear it. And the kingdom of heaven and, and how God was amongst his people. Jesus, and you know, we talk about our core values here, prayer, care, and share. That's what Jesus was doing. 
he was praying for and caring for and sharing with the people. So he wasn't just bringing a physical healing, he was bringing a spiritual healing. Something that would have exhausted us but was not too much for him to handle. Jesus' words would offer, and they still do to this day, freedom, hope, peace, eternal life. Through his teaching, he showed his concern and understanding. His preaching showed his commitment to the people through his concerns. His healing showed his concern for wholeness. On those healing miracles, they authenticated his teaching and preaching. It was proof that he was sent by God. And I take comfort in the fact that as Jesus' ministry grew, not through what we would call a megachurch, but through small village synagogues. Mark and I talk a lot about the fact that we, we want to fill all these seats. And we want to see, you know, tons of people watching online. We want to have that happen. But I was struck by this. Jesus' ministry was done in small groups. And so he, and granted, there, there was probably 100, 200 people that day that got healed, but they went out and they went their separate ways and they didn't just go home. They shared his ministry and what he was doing. And it's interesting, synagogues in that time only existed if there were at least 10 families in the village or small town. It didn't have to be very big. I mean, I grew up in a little town of Prairie City, that's where I started life, and there are one, two, three, I think there's five churches now. There's less than a thousand people. Churches are very prevalent there. We went through uh, Linville and Sully on the way home last night, and the number of, and that's, they're smaller, smaller than that too, and yet they have multiple churches. Oh, it's through that small network that his fame grew exponentially. And the synagogue, it wasn't just a place for worship. This is not just a place for worship. We have Bible study here. We have the movies. And as I'm standing here, I'm looking at the covers of all three of the movies that we're going to be showing over the next three months. So it's a movie theater. It's a Hot Wheels racetrack. It's a restaurant meant for men's breakfast. It's so many things. It is a multi-purpose place. And synagogues were like that too. Sabbath, on, uh, worship on the Sabbath, and school during the week. And interestingly enough, the leader of the synagogue wasn't a preacher. He was an administrator. He had the job of basically filling the pulpit. So when an itinerant preacher such as Jesus would go, were going through, hey, you want to come in and give a message? And so Jesus would use that as an opportunity to go in and teach and preach. I could see, I could see the people as they're leaving healed some of them might not share. But that's like, that's like going to take your dog and out the backyard and you tell your friend to stay in the house, he'll be back in a minute. And you go to take the dog out and you see a snake out in the backyard, you turn around and you go back in, you don't want that dog out there with that. But then the friend going, oh, you're back quick. Yeah, she didn't want to go out. Well, I'm going to step out back. Okay. And they step out back, they get bit by a snake, and they say, why didn't you tell me? That's how we, if we are not sharing, that's what's happening. We're allowing people to be put into harm's way. 
Now it's interesting, at the very beginning of this, Philip is mentoring Matthew. And can, if you can imagine, their personalities are so very different. And as we'll see on Wednesday night when we watch the episode, um, just how that conversation goes. Because Philip is very, he's just full of life. And he's talking to Matthew, he's just very matter of fact. It's like, you know, everything's checkmarked. But as they're walking, they're passing the people standing in line. And it's in that moment that Philip teaches Matthew Psalm 139a. And it's because Matthew wants to know where he needs to start. He doesn't know where to start. He says, listen to this and repeat it back to me. He says, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are where? You are there. Philip's using this passage to let Matthew know that no matter where we are, God has access to us. He has access to his entire creation, even in the hardest to reach places. Is it any wonder that when we reach rock bottom, there's a reason that that is a saying, when we reach rock bottom, what well, God is the rock at the bottom. He's there to lift us up. He is our rock. He is there. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Now, we all have plans. We all have dreams. And we all go to work very hard on making those plans and dreams come true. And many of you already know this. To make the most out of your life, you have to include God in those plans and in those dreams. And it's our prayer here at Grace Street, if you've not found this out yet, that you do. If you're watching online and you don't know this truth yet, reach out to us. We want to share that with you. God alone knows what is best for us. Think about it. Those of you who are parents, talk with your kid and you tell them what's best for them. Yesterday, Krista, to her nephew goes, dude, you really need to slow down. He goes speeding around the same corner that he did when she said that, and he slipped, and he fell, and he caught the back of his ear on a picnic table. He didn't listen. The more experience we have, the more wisdom we have. God has all the wisdom. He has all, He knows everything, and he, he can share that with us. And this is something that we've been doing all along through prayer, care, and share here at Grace Street, whether that's through church or the movies or horse track racing, whatever it is. We have included God in our hopes, our dreams, and our plans. There isn't a time that Mark and I don't get together that we don't talk about our hopes and dreams and our plans and where God is leading us. And if we don't hear God directing us that way, we aren't moving that direction. Because without him, our plans can fail. We see this time and time again throughout the Old Testament. What happened when, they, when the Israelites would go into battle with God? They would win. But they forgot to uh, talk to God first, and eh, they usually got their behinds kicked. And that's putting it pretty lightly. We have to let him lead, and then we can fulfill his call for our lives. Now, the, the best way to do this is to start by listening. And I've said this many times. I start my day in absolute quiet, and then I go grab a cup of coffee, and I go and I start reading, do my daily devotional. That's the way I start my day. If I found that I started any other way, if I push the God part off till the evening, yeah, the day doesn't necessarily go so hot. My frame of mind's not in the right place. It saddens me to know that there are people who claim to be Christians, but they're not diving into God's word. They're not spending time with him. And, and I know Mark would agree with me in this. Biblical literacy is on a steeper decline 
today than it has ever been. There's many different reasons for it, but it is heartbreaking. And the biggest one is there are false teachers out there who are leading people astray. I know we both get great joy in seeing people who dive in and just want to know more. They want to, they've got a hunger and a thirst for God's word. Recently, I had someone reach out to me and ask, how do I let go and let God? This person wants what they see in others who follow Jesus. They added, I just don't feel like I should. I know I'm not doing the things I should be doing. Now, when they said, I don't feel like I should, they were uh, indicating that they don't feel like they should as far as knowing Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And through this conversation, it gave me the opportunity to share how they can dive into God's Word. And I'm looking forward to seeing where this leads. I followed up with them yesterday. <laughs> Baby steps, I guess. But I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in God appointments. And it was as we were having that conversation, I get this notification because it's all through text. I get this little bing, Diane posted on Facebook. <laughs> Click. And she had posted this. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Now, we're going to sing that today, so don't worry about me just speaking it. But we, these people that were coming to Jesus for healing, they knew that they needed something. And so we need to continue to go to God. And as the the... It's getting later in the day in the episode, and Matthew goes over and he talks to Mary Magdalene and Rama, and they have just started reading the Torah, starting to learn, which if you think about it, that's something you wouldn't have seen in that day. Women were taught, they didn't necessarily read it themselves. It just happened that both of them knew how to read. And as the day starts to get uh, further along and it's getting darker out and the disciples are gathering around and they're exhausted. And so this is where my working title had come from for Mark. They were butting heads. They were disagreeing on whether or not they were there to fight the Romans or they were just to control the crowd. What was Jesus doing healing when he should have been going out and slaughtering the Romans and taking it back Israel back for the Israelites. One of them says, what is happening? What are we a part of? One of them says, is it wrong to say that I have no idea? Another one says, no, it makes me feel better. Whatever it is, I wish he had waited until tomorrow. He didn't wait. As soon as they reached where they were going, he started in. There was no time to rest. It was time to get moving and get going. And just as we pray for Jesus' return, because think about everything that's going on in the world, I pray for his return. So they prayed that they would just get to see him when they were talking about when they were little. They heard about the Messiah. They wanted to just see him. They never had any clue that they would come to serve him. They never dreamed they would be part of the ministry. They, just like all the other Jews, believed that Jesus was coming to defeat the Romans, not healing people. They were so eager to fight. They wanted to fight amongst themselves not realizing that the fight they are part of is a spiritual one, which is a physical battle, you can see your opponent. A spiritual battle, 
we don't see. When I'm in this space, I feel safe. I feel like God, and we there's a comedian that makes fun of this statement, but I feel like there's a hedge of protection around us. The, the walls are completely covered by God. He is allowing us to have a safe space. But as soon as I walk out that door, I feel susceptible to all the things in the world. So if I haven't, and I, I told the person I was talking to earlier this week, I said, you need to put on the full armor of God so that when you do step out in the world, you can feel as safe as like I feel in here. But here's why they thought or had the viewpoint that Jesus was coming back for a physical battle. Let's look at Zechariah 14, 2 and 4. This is from the uh, NASB. It says, For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured. The houses plundered, the women ravished, and half the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in, in the middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. This is part of the reason that they thought that Jesus was coming back with that big old sword and he was going to fight him. There was also a belief that this would not happen until we had our house in order, until we were all, had it all together. Did anybody see that happening? I don't have it all together. I think God, Jesus came back when he did and I look forward to his return. But not all the disciples had heard everything that had been taught. And Mary Magdalene was one of them, and it caused the disciples to pause for a moment when she said this, I don't think he is waiting for us to be holy. I think he is here because we cannot be holy without him. Now, remember, this is from the series. They are filling in some of the pieces to this. This is not a passage or uh, something you're going to read in the scriptures. But it's inferred. He isn't waiting for us to have it all together. So when we say that Jesus meets you right where you're at, we absolutely mean that. The thing is, he's not going to leave you there. He's going to help you up. And that's what we want to do with the people that we have in our sphere of influence. We want to lift you up and help you get where you need to be. Jesus meets us in the midst of our sin. And Paul talks about this in Romans. He meets us in the midst of our sin to make us righteous. Now there's also a concern that the people are only believing in and praising Jesus because they are being healed. He did something for me, so I'm going to believe in him. And it's going to be like that seeds that are thrown on the rocks, right? You sprout up quickly, but then wither because the roots are not long enough. But we really have to go back to our that passage from Matthew 4, 23 through 26, or 25, excuse me. He's preaching and teaching. He's using the miracles to show that he is the Son of God. Is this what we're dealing with today in our world? People get this flashy message or flashy service or this, basically they go to church for entertainment and then they say they believe, but they live the other how many hours in the week beyond that one or two on Sunday in a completely different way. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah said. And this comes from 35, 4, and 6 from the New Living Translation. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer. And those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will rush forth in the wilderness and streams of water. 
the wayside. Healing is how we can recognize Jesus as the Messiah. When it says in here that God is coming to destroy your enemies, that isn't necessarily like is the Jews thinking that it, the Romans. It's anything in your life that is your enemy. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's the people around you that are pulling you down. Maybe it's because you're not in the right space or the right place where you need to be. Those are your enemies as much as the Romans as were for the Israelites. And in Matthew 11, John the Baptist had sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we be looking for someone else? And this is what Jesus told them. He says, go back to John and tell the, him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. Jesus knew that John would have his answer in this when he heard it. When he heard that Jesus was healing, just as Isaiah had said the Messiah would do. People have to see something tangible sometimes before they will believe it. Well, as I, I hear it all the time, I'll, see, I'll believe it when I see it, right? But if they don't see something tangible, will they still believe? Tangible evidence has been shown over and over again. The religious say, show us a miracle, Jesus, and we'll believe in who you say you are. He showed all kinds of miracles, yet they were so set in their ways, they were so selfish, they had decided what they wanted God to be, that they refused to see outside of, like the horse blinders, or outside this little box that they put God in. Now, some people may have been drawn to Jesus out of that selfishness because they wanted to be healed. But that miraculous healing shows the world that Jesus was the Messiah, the one they had been waiting for. And whether or not someone believes, that's not for you and I to decide. I hear way too often, well, they're not a believer. They look at the way they, not, I'm just excuse after excuse why somebody should be a believer. You don't know. You don't know what's here. You don't know what's between them and God. All we can do is come alongside iron sharpens iron, come together as one. The problem with the evidence is that rather than believing in God, they'd rather find reasons, earthly reasons why it happened. We have to stop putting God in that box. And honestly, one can look at some of the very first examples in, in the scriptures. And I see this really this whole section that we've been in with, with the woman at the well and, and the message from last week and today, this is the very first examples of evangelizing. The woman at the well, she wasn't healed, but what did she do? Well, in the show, we see her dropping both jars of water, full jars of water, and running on the path back to town, telling everyone she ran into, everyone she knew about what had happened to her. What people have to say matters. Telling others about our personal relationship with Jesus, sharing what God has done for us, is the best form of evangelism. I love, Mark and I try to get together every week, and, and we talk, and sometimes we make it to the business of the church, other times we just spend talking about the things that we've seen God doing in the week, and how he is working in others' lives. And these are the things that connect us. It makes God real to others and offers them the same hope that we have. And just like the woman at the well and the people who are being healed, we are called to share our testimony with as many people as we can. Rhetorical question, will it be easy? Answer, nope. And I can, and, and I can hear Mark and I getting this this statement. I'm still trying to figure out this whole Jesus thing. How can I possibly tell others? 
within moments of Jesus telling the woman at the well who he was, she was gone. She was off telling everybody she knew. She didn't wait to learn more about the scripture. She just went and told people. The disciples are still trying to figure out this new life that they have with Jesus and what it's all about. And they struggled to get along at first. Will it be worth it? Most definitely, yes. We are here to serve others on behalf of our Savior. Hear that word serve. It's going to come up here in just a second. No job is too big or too small. I read an article years ago when I was a youth pastor that said, how do I worship? And it was an article about setting up the chairs. Coming in early and just setting up the chairs for worship. Dallas Jenkins said this, our job is not to feed the multitude. Our job is to bring the loaves and fishes. Let that sink in. Our job is to serve. Jesus used healing to prove who he was. In doing so, others would start to tell of the things he had done, and his fame would grow. I keep hearing the disciples saying, well, our fame's going to grow. It's coming from the episode that we're going to watch this week. Our fame's going to grow. We got to, you know, they're talking about all these things. They're not even talking about any of it that matters. It's about serving others. Father God, as we take and let all of this sink in, it doesn't matter where we're at. You meet us there, and but you don't leave us there, Father. You raise us up. You lift us up to a place where we can be a part of your kingdom, to where we can have that eternal life. Father, we just thank you for all that you do to connect us with each other and with you. In Jesus' name. As we come into this time of communion today, uh, I'd like you to think about the healing process. Now, in this chapter in Matthew, it talks all about healing and about Jesus doing all these healing things. And that's a, a physical healing. But see, there's that spiritual healing component that comes along with it. And then when we think about a mass healing, what do you think about? We think about mass catastrophes and things like that, but the best example of a mass healing was when Jesus went to the cross. See, he, he broke down sin and death for all time. He healed all of us, gave us that opportunity, if we believe in him, that we will be healed from our sin and our sinful nature. And that's a mass healing. That happened on the cross. It's something that we need to remember and we need to hang on to. And that's one of the things that our communion time is all about is, is understanding all of the things that came into play for Christ in our lives to pull us out of the position that we were in and give us that new life, rebirth, restoration. That's what it's about. So we can't lose sight of it. So we need to remember that. So as we come into this time of remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us in communion today, remember that mass healing that happened for all time, for all peoples, all at once. One sacrifice for all. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. Later on in the meal, he took the cup, and after he blessed it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. The mass healing. The body and the blood of Christ. 
broken for you and shed for you so that you can be free from those things that would keep you from God. Thanks be to God. Sometimes these open better than others. <laughs> the body of Christ broken for you. blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. It's a wiggle. It's a wiggle. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's time now for prayers for the people. <clears throat> Anybody in need of prayer? I just want to keep my coworker Sharon and her family. Okay. The grandson Jace is going through the chemo oh. treatments and things for the leukemia, and it's oh, he's yes. only five. Oh my oh, god. And it's just so hard. Um, I mm -hmm. ran into her husband Joe at Target on Friday, and just mm -hmm. you know, I was in line behind him to pick up a prescription, mm -hmm. and um, it's just so heartbreaking. You know, they've yes. always been so happy. It's just so heartbreaking. I would just want to keep them in prayer. Oh, yes, for sure. Okay. We'll start with Isaiah 49, 13. Shout for joy, O heavens. Rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. Father God, we praise your holy name this morning. For you have not forgotten us. You go before us. You hem us in on all sides. Your love and mighty arms protect us all from the powers of darkness. You are our God, and there is no other. Father God, you are so good to us. There is no place we can go that you do not see us. We cannot hide anything from you. You watch over us through every trial in this life. And if we call on your name, Jesus, and pray, you are there to hear our cries for help. We lift up. Becky's family for the loss of a loved one. Please comfort them, touch their minds and hearts, and heal their pain. We lift up Harold Hickson as we fervently pray for his well-being to keep him strong and courageous as he faces each new day. Father God, we lift up Sharon and Joe and Jace, and we just um, want your hand of healing to be upon Jace, Lord Jesus, upon this whole family, for they need you right now, Lord God. Let the Holy Spirit come into their home and just fill their home with love and peace. As Jace goes through these treatments, Lord God, keep him healthy and strong and bring them to you, Father God. Bring them where they need to be. And we lift up Joe for continued prayers for healing after his knee surgery. We ask for your presence and power to heal his knees perfectly and quickly. Give him strength through the healing process, Lord Jesus. We thank you for Amanda and Kelly's lives, Lord God. They are facing trials that only you can walk through them with. Place loving people around them in their paths. Always get them the help that they need when they need it. Wrap your loving arms around them so that they know they are loved by the one who gives life and breath to all who call upon his name, Jesus. We thank you and praise your holy name for watching over all of us, comforting our hearts in all trials of this life. You watch over our children and our grandchildren each and every day. You give us and protect us from the depths of despair. Your love we cannot fathom, for it reaches to the ends of the earth. Your Holy Spirit guides us by day, and your armor protects us by night and against the evil powers of this dark world. You are our Redeemer, our ever-present help in times of trouble. We thank you and honor you today. Jesus, you are our God. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Those of you online, uh, please watch or check the comment section for our worship list so that you can join us in that. 
As we close our online portion, I leave us with this prayer. God, here we are. We need you. We want you, Father. We are weary and we need your rest. We know that you are good. But right now, what some of us are experiencing isn't that great. Please help us, Father. Breathe with us and remind us that you are near. And even though what we are experiencing may not be so good, please redeem every part of our lives for good and for your glory. In Jesus' name.